When you're dealing with something visually challenging, sometimes you may want to screen it, other times enhance it. I'll show you what I mean right after this. During my years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore and create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home, a show about blurring the lines between inside and out with an emphasis on design. In today's show, we're going to talk about subtle screening. I think screening is a very important design principle. In fact, we talk a lot about that in this idea of framing the view. You want to frame the views you want and you want to screen the ones you don't want to see. We're also going to touch on some things going on out here at the Garden Home Retreat that I'm very excited about. It's many of the green initiatives or environmentally friendly building practices we're underway with. Take a look at the well house and the main house. There's lots of things going on there that are very green centric, like rainwater harvesting, using soybean insulation. And when it comes to creating the garden, well, it's all organic and we've applied all those principles in preparing the soil. The Garden Home Retreat is certainly a rural property. And being rural, that means that one's utilities, and in this case, water, can become an issue. What we have here is a well house to help satisfy some of our water needs. And you may be asking yourself, why did you build such a large well house, and why is it positioned here in this field of daffodils? So when I designed this building, I thought, you know, I just can't have an ordinary building in the middle of all this beauty. So we decided to create one that is both historically accurate and one that is visually consistent. It's in the Greek Revival style. You see it reflects the style of the house and it reflects the style of the entry gate pavilion. Only in this case you can see instead of stone what we used was brick. But we did the same lime wash covering over it so it would have that same pale butter yellow color. Okay, enough about the size and function of the building. I have to tell you, we really got lucky here. You see, we drilled a well with the hope of finding water. And what we discovered was over 60 gallons a minute right here. So that's why I positioned it in this part of the field. You see, the door opens up and looks over to a pond where you can see some of those funny curly feathered geese called Sebastiopoles, as well as some of our swans. Now inside this building, we have all the standard gear, the pump, we have a filtration system, and plenty of room for storage. This will be perfect because it'll serve as a feed room for the white dorper sheep. And we have a power source here. So if we need to pull power to our electric fences or for any other use, we have it here. So it makes it very handy. So as you can see, on a rural property, buildings have to serve many functions. In this case, it's a focal point in the landscape across those beautiful daffodils. It serves as a well house, as well as an electricity source, and certainly a place for us to store food for the animals. I thought it'd be fun to bring you up here in the attic and show you what's going on. I'm really excited about this space because typically attics go underutilized, but what we thought we would do is take advantage of this space and it's very generous. The guys are making a lot of progress up here and I thought I'd point out some of the elements that are going to make this space just as comfortable as any other room in the house. Now, behind these walls, we have the soybean insulation, generously applied. Now, the board that you see here, which will be our finished surface, is this bead board. Now, if you look back to the late 19th century and early 20th centuries, bead board was a popular way to cover a wall. But in those days, you used strips of wood, which were rather thick. What I have here is a product that's made to look like beadboard. It's actually a form of plywood that has the bead pressed into it. So we're getting that 19th century look up here in the attic, but we're not having to go to the expense of applying each board, and we're not using valuable resources in the way of trees and having wood that's really larger than we need. Because of the insulation, I can put a thin board up here and it'll be just as snug as it would otherwise. 
Now to the right, you can see the brick of the chimney. There are multiple flues going up through this large chimney that will heat the various floors of the house. Now speaking of the house heat, you know we have that radiant heat system that starts at the roof, the south face, and heats water preheats the hot water here, but it also will run through PEX tubing in the floor of the basement. Now you may ask, what does that have to do with the attic? Well, what happens is that radiant heat will come up through the bricks in the basement, warm the basement, move up through the first floor, the second floor, and into the attic. Pretty good, huh? Now if we step out here on the porch, <laughs> there's the wind again, shut the door here. I can't wait to show you what we have here. The shutters just arrived. Just look at these, aren't they beautiful? Now, we're talking about screening and framing views. These shutters, one will be placed on each side of these doors, all right? So this shutter is the size of one of those doors. And what we'll be able to do is frame this composition with these shutters. It's going to give this porch such a wonderful feeling. These will be painted that traditional black green. It's the same black green that we've painted the Dutch doors. Now, Dutch doors to me are a classic way of blurring the lines between inside and out. You can open the upper glassed part and you can leave the solid part closed and you can enjoy both the inside and the outside. Similarly, shutters allow us to do much the same thing. You can close the shutters, but still have the breezes blow through the house. The other great thing about shutters is that you can close the house up and they can certainly be a protection during storms. And that's really the reason they were made in the beginning. Shutters are a traditional way to protect the home and protect the windows. All right, I wanted to come out here on the porch for a purpose. We're talking about screening and framing. Well, the guys are working on the framing for the screen porch here. But beyond that, I want to talk about the view that you get from these porches. When you look out, you see a mountain range. Then a little closer to the foreground, you see the river, a band of forest, and then the orchard. And the orchard, well, it's something that I don't want to have very close to the house because the trees don't always look perfect, but from a distance, they look great, particularly the rhythm and the pattern they're planted in. In fact, the guys are down there trying to get the last few apples planted. We have about 18 varieties of apple trees that are going into this heritage apple orchard. Now, give me two seconds and I'll meet you in the orchard and I wanna give you some pointers on planting apple trees. What you want to do is plant your fruit trees in the late winter or early spring. I use root stimulator when we put them in the ground, put bags around them so we could keep them moist through the summer. The last thing we did when we planted them is we made sure we put a generous tree well around them. So as the water comes down the slope, it would catch around the trees and we put a layer of bark or mulch around them to help hold moisture. Now I can't wait to start picking apples, although it's going to be a few years. Nothing excites me more about a building project than when it comes to actually getting some planting done, and that's what we're doing here. You see, we're going to do some screening, and with a day like today with the wind blowing the way it is, you think I need a windscreen out here. But let me give you an idea of what I'm going to try to achieve through this idea of framing a view and screening a view. If you take this urn, this urn is sitting on axis with this building, all right? It lines up perfectly with the window. What I'm going to do is pull a hedge from the corner of the house to the corner of the barn. Now the reason for this is that I want you to be surprised when you come through an opening which will be on this axis. You'll come right in front of the urn, walk through, go around the little building and you'll see a garden and the river beyond. So in this case what we're doing is we're using the hollies to screen and we're also using the hollies to frame a view. Now we've completed the other side. We have the hollies going 
east and west and also north and south that frame that entire lawn over there. Now the plant of choice here is the needlepoint holly. You see, I love this plant. I use it a lot. In fact, in my town garden, it frames the fountain garden there. And it's been a beautiful addition and does everything it needs to. It provides privacy and it also creates this wonderful sense of enclosure. Now, here we have a bald and burlap tree, meaning that the tree was dug out of a field with a root ball and wrapped in burlap for shipping and holding the ball together. Now there are advantages and disadvantages to bald and burlap. One of the disadvantages here, since this root ball is a little small, is that I'm going to have to come in and cut this tree back, oh about a third of it, and shear up the sides to bring the top part of the green growth in line in proportion with the root ball itself. Now what I have here is a little needlepoint holly grown in a five gallon container. Now this tree going in the ground will start growing immediately. With a bald and burlap because we have cut roots, you're not going to see much growth the first year. In fact, the old adage goes like this for bald and burlap, the first year it sleeps, the second year it creeps, and in the third year it leaps. So it's going to take a full three seasons for this plant's root system to recover for us to start seeing some dramatic growth. This little guy right here will probably catch up with it within the next three years. Not quite, because you won't get this caliper size that you see here, but it's going to come close. What we're doing is we're planting the two of them together, because what I need out here is instant effect. So we're going to plant a hedge of these, and then we're going to interplant these smaller ones, these five gallons, between them. Now, when we plant them, I'm going to use a root stimulator. Again, I want to try to get those roots going as quickly as possible. We're going to take the existing soil and we're going to combine it with a good potting mix full of humus that will, again, stimulate that root growth because that's what it's all about. And then what we'll have is a beautiful screen that will reveal the river beyond once you come around it. Just what I want. You know, one of the aspects of garden design that I particularly enjoy is creating things that work for both an aesthetic situation and for one that also embraces nature. Let me give you an example. Right here, we've used this hedge to screen off the vegetable garden. And what I've done is I've created an outdoor living space by having a wall here, if you will, and then the walls of the back of the studio here at the Garden Home Retreat. And then we have two entry spaces between these two walls. Now what supports this room-like feel is the fact that we just finished with all the shearing and pruning of these hedges. We whipped them into shape, cutting off about a third of the top, and then cutting them on a slight bevel. And so they really do have the geometry or the feel of a room or a wall. Now what we'll have to do is come back and take some sharp shears and cut some of these ragged edges and then from time to time you'll see where we we broke a limb and the leaves have already died. But the point about this hedge beyond the aesthetic that I want to make is that it makes great cover for our little feathered friends. Now I don't consider the wild birds pets but I sure do enjoy watching them in my garden and I look for ways to give them support. In my city garden, I have this needlepoint holly hedge and for years, it's served the same purpose as it will here. It's given birds cover from inclement weather, uh, it's protection from predators, uh, and it has certainly given some species food. For instance, the cedar waxwings love these red berries late in winter and early spring. It's really comical to watch them in a feeding frenzy over all those berries. I love songbirds of all types, and I know you probably feel the same way. And there are people who have actually dedicated their life's work to understand these beautiful creatures better. Everywhere you go, you can see birds. That's one of the great things about birds. That's why birds are so popular. They're just so accessible, so viewable to everybody. 
But if you want to have birds in your backyard so you can see them more closely on a regular basis, there are four things that you need to provide. That's food, water, shelter, and also a place to nest. And you can provide those four things in both a, a natural way and in a supplemental way. For food, of course, the natural way is to plant native plant species for the birds. Trees, shrubs, vines, grasses that provide the seeds and fruits and nuts that birds need to eat. And I stress native plant species because those are the ones that the birds are adapted to. They're the ones that provide the right kinds of food, the right kinds of nutrition at the right times of year. They need less pesticides, less watering. So they're a benefit for you, for the environment, and for the birds. If you're gonna be providing these things in a supplemental way, that's often through providing feeders, through a, a bird bath, or through a nest box then you wanna make sure that you clean those things on a regular basis. Birds will spread disease from one individual to the next when they congregate in large numbers, and they do that at your backyard feeders. So if you keep your feeders clean, then you keep down the incidence and spread of disease. So that's part of being a good steward for your birds and maintaining a healthy backyard for birds. Today I've seen blue jays, American robins, I saw a mockingbird that was imitating other birds. One of my favorite birds and one of the birds that I just saw today is the cedar waxwing. A lot of birders enjoy keeping a list of the birds. That's part of the fun, the enjoyment, helps them to go back and reminisce over the birds that you've seen. And then you can take that a step further. There are ways that we as average citizens who are watching birds in our backyards and watching birds in our local parks and refuges can contribute to science by submitting our lists, by par participating in a number of citizen science programs. We can all contribute to science, to bird conservation, just by going out, watching the birds, and keeping track of the birds that we see in different places. I have to say, I really enjoy this part of the show. It's where you send photographs in of your property. We play around with some ideas about how to improve the landscape. Today, we're taking a look at Bonnie's house in Michigan. Now, what we have here is a very long, traditional style house. Now, what I think I'd like to do with the landscape, just to change, I'll start with maybe taking down these shrubs because they're just a little tall. And it looks to me like you enter on this side and come in behind the brick wall, or actually it looks like a stone wall, and you can sit under the porch. So I would wanna bring these shrubs down just a little bit, Bonnie, because they're too tall. Then what I would like to do, given the fact that we've got this long horizontal line like this, I'd like to break that up a little bit. So why don't we explore what might go kind of in this area, which might screen a little bit of the garage door, and then balance it maybe here on this side, all right? So we'll just erase those lines and we'll get started. I think that what would be really beautiful here, since you're in Michigan, you do so well with those gorgeous white birch. So what I'm thinking is over here, if we did some birch trees, a cluster of maybe three multi-trunk birch on the corner, it would create almost kind of an arbor-like effect going into this walkway around into the front. Now, I would try to counterbalance that over here somehow with maybe another grove of birch like this. And then what we might do is underplant those birch with rhododendron. You do so well with those rhododendron and a gorgeous white rhododendron under both of these clumps of birch would be fantastic, all right? Now, if you're really into perennials and you're in a great part of the world to be into perennials. Michigan, you can grow almost anything. And I see over here on the right-hand side, you have some peonies. What I would suggest is then bring out, you're gonna have a bed that's gonna come around the edge here. I'd expand this bed, let the bed come around here, and then come back and broaden this bed. I'm gonna broaden it over, take up some of that lawn and bring it around, all right? Now with that in place, 
let's go back to this color. I would punctuate the front of this bed with an evergreen shrub like this. It looks like these might be yews. So we might put another one here, another one here, another one here, another one here, and then along the front create a rhythm of an evergreen like that. All right. In between, then I would come back and fill in here with a ground cover. All right. And punctuating with that ground cover, or punctuating the ground cover, I should say, I would add some big clumps of hosta. And then on this side, I would add hosta here with ground cover across the front of the rhododendron. And then in this bed, I can see you have peonies. What a gorgeous, gorgeous spring or early summer flower. I would add some other perennials that would give you some visual interest throughout the growing season, particularly late in the season. So we've talked about using white rhododendron. Your hostas are gonna have beautiful lavender to white blooms. What if we went with a theme that kind of worked with the color of the house here where we use gray foliage plants, plants like Russian sage, lamb's ear, maybe even some platycodon or the balloon flower, uh, some purple cone flower, all in here worked in around your peonies. And I'd even add some more of those peonies because that is a perennial that's hard to beat. As you can see, Bonnie, your garden by adding all these beautiful flowers can only get better from here. I hope this helps. <music>I want to take a moment and talk about vocabulary. Not word vocabulary, but design element vocabulary, which plays a very important role out here at the Garden Home Retreat. You see, we try to choose a certain vocabulary and stick with it in terms of the details. Now, this is one of the gates that I'm going to use right here entering into this part of the garden. And it will serve a purpose out here to help screen a situation. Now, as you know, in building, you have to make decisions on the inside that often impact the outside and vice versa. Well, that's the case here with our heating and air units. We're gonna have heating and air out here, but I just don't want them sitting out in the middle of the garden. So we're going to take this motif, this picket, and this design and use it to screen those heating and air units. You'll see this same motif at the entry gates and the arbors, various places around here. The idea is to have something that will allow the units to breathe. I could plant a hedge around them and that would be fine, but hedges can be really dense and can be difficult for the air to come through. So by using this, accented with a few plants, hopefully we'll be able to screen them off effectively. Well, as you can see, we continue to make good progress on the house. It's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. We took a look at the importance of screening, screening things we don't want to see, but opening up the views and framing the views of things we do want to see. We also touched on birds, one of my favorite topics, and the importance of creating habitat in our own gardens for our little feathered friends. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at plnsmith.com.